Well, it's April Fool's Day. Sorry for being a few minutes late getting started. Um, so hope everybody's doing well. Um, happy April 1st. So COVID pandemic continues. Um, global cases are up almost to a million. I predict we'll be at a million by tomorrow morning, 905,000 today, um, up from 825 yesterday. So almost 100,000 uh, person increase. Global deaths are up to 46,000 globally. Uh, U.S. climbed to 205,000 cases. And I just want to remind you, today's April 1st. If we go back to the beginning of March, we had 100 cases in the United States. And so I want you to think about the magnitude of that increase in one month, 100 cases to 205,000 cases. So Italy continues to climb, uh, 110,000 cases, 13,000 deaths. Spain has almost caught up with Italy. And again, it's a terrible situation in Spain. Uh, their deaths are now up to 9,000. And remember that they were lagging about a week behind Italy. Um, and so my expectation is they're actually going to exceed Italy as this goes forward. We're up to 180 uh, countries across the globe. So if we focus specifically on U.S., so again, I want you to remember that number, 205,000. Um, you may have heard from the President's um, Corona Task Force briefing last evening that with the newer modeling that really fits with the modeling that I talked to you about yesterday, that it looks like uh, we are having an impact with social distancing, that there's specific really hot spots, of course, New York being the epicenter, but that our social distancing and our practices really are making an impact. The numbers now are still very large. On the low end, around 100,000 deaths when this is all said and done uh, by August 1st is when the, mark, uh, the modeling goes out to will be about 100,000 deaths. Uh, across the U.S. Um, up to a number of about 240,000. And so hopefully um, we're going to continue to do what we're doing um, and that number will be as close to 100,000 as possible. Um, New York is having a terrible time. Um, they continue to rise very quickly. So up to 83,000 cases with 2,100 deaths. And again, New York City is the vast majority of those cases and deaths. Florida has continued to climb quickly. I am really happy to say that Governor DeSantis uh, made the right decision today and actually issued finally a stay at home uh, policy in Florida. Um, their deaths climbed quickly uh, 10 yesterday from 77 to 87. In the state of Ohio, uh, we had a big rise yesterday. We are up to 2,800 uh, cases from 2,200. Uh, our death rate climbed up to 65, so that's 10 from yesterday. We have 679 people in the hospital, 222 patients in the ICU, which is right around that 9% number that we keep talking about in terms of intensive care patients with this. Now, you remember the modeling I talked about yesterday. Well, so um, it's really interesting from that IHME data. Um, that's where, um, and I put it on my um, Instagram yesterday, kind of the graph snapshot to show in each place, be it US globally or in each of the states, what's happening to the curve with specific numbers about what the estimated needs are going to be in terms of hospital beds and ICU beds. Um, and when the peak is going to be. So it shifted one day with data. You know, as we keep adding data, we can refine these modeling so it becomes more accurate. So hospital beds are anticipated to be needed at uh, 260,000. They're estimate across the U.S. They're expecting a, a shortage of about 84,000 beds. So that's up from yesterday pretty significantly. ICU beds 39,000 with a shortage looking at. Um, uh, current capacity of about 19,000 ICU beds and ventilators that we're needing look like it's over 30,000 still. The maximum death per day increased compared to when I talked to you about this yesterday up to 2,600 per day. And again, from this estimate, we're on the low end of normal for a total death in the United States by August 4th of 100,000. In New York, so of course the epicenter right now, New York is going to peak much earlier than we are. So the estimated peak in New York is April 9th. Um, it's estimated that they will need 76,000 hospital beds um, and they have a shortage of 62,000 hospital beds. They're going to need an additional 11.6 thousand ICU beds with a shortage of 11,000 ICU beds. Uh, they're going to need an additional 10,000 ventilators. The maximum death per day will peak April 9th at about 845 deaths per day in New York for a total death in the state of 16,000. Florida is going to peak much later, of course. So Florida, again, kind of um, 
you know, much slower onset. Finally, I think appropriately, Governor DeSantis uh, shut things down. Their peak is really expected uh, to be May 2nd, so about four weeks from now. They have an estimated need of 17,000 hospital beds, and they actually look like they're going to be okay from current estimates. Now, again, this is a little bit uncertain because they just issued the stay at home order. So we may actually see in the coming days as we get more data and more cases in Florida that this isn't exactly accurate. But at least as of today, it looks like total number of beds, they'll be okay. Although they'll be about a thousand short on ICU beds and about 2000 short on ventilators. Maximum death rate in the state of Ohio is estimated to be about 180 and total deaths in Florida of 7,000. So what about Ohio? I can't say enough about how I believe that the stay at home, um, the early stay at home policy uh, that Governor DeWine instituted has really been helpful. If you look at the graphs on the IHME site, you can see that we actually have flattened the curve a lot and we really are now below kind of hospital capacity and um, in terms of our numbers, what's being predicted, um, which is fantastic. Um, the peak for us will be April 19th. Um, our estimated hospital bed need is about 6,600, and we don't look like we're going to have a shortage, which is terrific. Today on Governor DeWine's um, two o'clock briefing, he was really talking about how he was reorganizing the state of Ohio into three regions so that again, there could be distributions between hospitals where some hospitals may be full um, and can redistribute uh, patients so that we, again, we are adequately utilizing our resources and everybody is getting a hospital bed and an ICU bed when they need them. It looks like we're gonna need um, an additional almost 1,000 ICU beds, but again, looks like we have capacity for that. Um, and we're gonna need about 800 ventilators. Um, so I think we're in far better shape, uh, certainly than uh, the overall country and certainly than New York, which is really in a terrible situation right now. Our maximal death rate is estimated to be about 68 a day um, and our total number of deaths about 2,000 by the end, um, you know, of when the projections go out to, which is August 4th. So um, keep up the good work is what I would say. So um, I think on the briefing today from Governor DeWine, um, you know, it's pretty clear what the messaging is. Although I talked yesterday about thinking that the end of April was a very realistic date uh, for projecting now to the stay at home. You may be aware that Virginia and Maryland and Washington DC have extended their stay at home to June 10th, I believe it is. And I'm not exactly sure why they pitch, pick that date, um, but that seems a little far out, at least the way that I'm interpreting the data. But what I did learn on Governor DeWine's presentation today was just that it really, of course, which we knew is not going to be an on or off switch, which is that on Monday you have a stay at home and Tuesday everything can go back to normal, which is that we're going to have a gradual uh, return to functioning. Um, but one of the things that was mentioned, which you know I think you all should remember, is that as we flattened the peak, what we've done is kind of extend it, right? So it's a, it's a slower peak, it's flatter, but it actually has a more gradual resolution. And so I think the take home is the peak, in, at least in Ohio, is estimated to be April 19th. Um, it's likely that in May we will start to return to normal, but probably it's more like a really summer before things are actually back to normal, which, um, if you're like me, probably feels like a really long time. Um, one of the things that's not COVID related that I just saw that I thought I would mention is uh, Zantac was completely pulled off the market now because of continued contamination that they found uh, from the NDMA. So if you have any Zantac in your cabinet, I suggest you pitch it um, and certainly it'll be taken off all of the um, grocery store and pharmacy shelves at this point. Okay, so I had a couple questions that came in from yesterday. Is there any additional danger for someone with mitral valve prolapse or thyroid disease? Um, again, not, there's not specific data about those two conditions. Um, I've talked about thyroid disease a little bit before, depending on the type of thyroid disease. Um, so Hashimoto's is considered an autoimmune thyroid disease. It's different than something like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that often is treated with immunosuppressive medications or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Um, with that said, you know, again, depending on the age of the individual, um, you know, I, I would encourage increased precaution with every kind of chronic illness you have. Um, but a young person with hypothyroidism or a young person with mitral valve prolapse, I would not 
um, think is at any increased risk than the rest of us. Um, and I think you're okay to keep doing exactly what we're all doing, social distancing and hand washing. Um, we know that Tylenol is recommended, or is it best to alternate Advil and Tylenol? So I'm a big fan um, for typical febrile fever illnesses, so flu, um, pneumonia, um, anything really, to uh, pain control for alternating Tylenol with Advil. And I talk to my patients a lot about that, um, kind of alternating 9 a.m. Advil, noon, uh, Tylenol, three o'clock Advil, and really staggering that, and you get certainly get better uh, pain and fever control. Um, in this setting, um, again, we've talked, there is a little bit of data about Advil being concerning um, in the setting of having a COVID infection. And so I think in this setting, different than kind of the use of medications without, new medications without data, in this setting, it really is a very simple thing just to avoid Advil um, and substitute just Tylenol for managing flu-like symptoms and fever. And that is what I would uh, continue uh, to encourage you to do. So increased risk for menopausal or postmenopausal women. Um, there's really no data about this um, at this point. I mean, we certainly are learning that across the board um, that diseases that um, present in both men and women, that we need to have the lens and look at those diseases in a gender specific way because we know that for the last hundred years we haven't done that and we've really missed the boat on all kinds of diseases that really look very different in women and we've assumed again that medication treatment or aspirin therapy or anything for that matter um, is the same in women as it is in men and we've missed the boat what we've been seeing with the COVID epidemic um, is actually a slight male um, predisposition um, in terms of more serious mortality in men. It's small, and actually in the state of Ohio right this minute, it's almost split 50-50 um, uh, female to male. So there, at least right now in Ohio, although our numbers are small, it looks equivalent. But across the globe, it actually does look like uh, there is a slight male predominance, and we don't understand why that is at all. Um, when we have not yet looked at um, women and specifically premenopausal women who have lots of estrogen who are menstruating compared to postmenopausal women and where, you know, certainly menopause, the average age of menopause is 51, um, and certainly older women are at more risk with COVID, um, but not specifically looking yet at the data around um, hormone implication and severity of infection. Um, but I think that is really something that we should and need to take a look at, and I hope as we collect data, we will. Um, and anything else? Let's see. Is there additional danger for someone with mitral valve prolapse or thyroid disease if they contract COVID-19? I think I just addressed that and I do not think so. Um, should we not be taking Celebrex since NSAIDs can complicate COVID and make it worse? So again, Celebrex is slightly different than Advil and Aleve. Um, it's a COX-2, which is slightly different. Um, you know, it has different impacts on platelets and clotting and bleeding um, with Celebrex. Um, with that said, I don't think there's any specific data about Celebrex compared to Advil or Aleve. And I think in general, I would try to avoid all anti-inflammatories right now until we have more data. Because again, um, I think it's easier to substitute Tylenol for Celebrex um, unless you really need the Celebrex. Now, certainly there are patients that have very significant rheumatoid arthritis um, and need to stay on their anti-inflammatories. And again, in that case, it's hard to know risk benefit, what I would do. But in general, I would um, avoid all of the anti-inflammatories, including Celebrex. What if someone's allergic to Tylenol? What fever reducer and pain relief would you recommend since Advil is not a good choice? Right, so, um, you know, it's uncommon to have an allergy to Tylenol, um, not unheard of. Um, I don't have a good answer for you in that setting right now. Um, all of the other antipyretics or anti-fever agents, really I would put in the class of um, aspirin derivatives and uh, NSAIDs, so I don't have a great answer for you with that. So hopefully you will not get it, so you won't need to take Tylenol or Advil. Is it possible to have uh, both COVID and influenza at the same time? And actually, it absolutely is. We have seen data from that now. So in the initial course of this outbreak, 
the recommendation was that everyone that was having flu-like symptoms because we were still seeing influenza A and B um, should have a nasal swab to confirm that their symptoms were not related to A or B. It subsequently has turned out that um, having a positive nasal, nasal swab for influenza B does not, or A, does not 100% confirm that you could not have COVID at the same time. And so I think at this point in time, um, really people are being tested for uh, both. Um, and again, a, so a positive does not necessarily uh, mean that you can't have COVID. We have seen that now. Should we not be taking aspirin? Okay. So, and I know this particular person that asked me this question, and I'm going to tell you, and I hope you're listening, don't stop your baby aspirin. So there are certain people that have medical conditions like established cardiovascular disease and a prior heart attack or prior stents or prior bypass surgery where absolutely there is huge benefit of a baby aspirin and you need to stay on that, forget COVID, um, because the benefit of aspirin for secondary prevention in someone that has cardiovascular disease is critical. So that's a very different situation than taking um, um, aspirin or um, Advil as a fever reducer. In that case, would something like Tamiflu help? So do you mean um, in this, I don't know what that means exactly, in the setting of not being able to take your aspirin? Um, I'm not sure, what I'm gonna say is Tamiflu um, really has no benefit with COVID. Um, Tamiflu doesn't have great benefit with influenza A either. Um, we certainly give it sometimes, but there's side effects with it. Um, we think it shortens um, the viral infection by maybe a day if you uh, take it early enough. Um, so again, I'm not using Tamiflu for uh, COVID infections at all. Oh, 325, not baby aspirin. Um, okay, so again, this particular individual, um, you know, there is um, some debate among cardiologists and primary care providers about what the appropriate dose of aspirin is between uh, for secondary prevention of heart attacks. Um, some people believe it's a single baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. Some believe it's two baby aspirins, and other people believe it's a full strength, 325. In this case, if you are using a single dose of aspirin a day for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, I would stay on that medication um, at whatever dose you've been continuing to take it um, because uh, you absolutely need the antiplatelet effect for prevention of that second heart attack. And anyone else send me your questions so I get them quickly? So I told you I thought my husband was gonna be here today. Unfortunately, um, he had another uh, commitment and couldn't make it. So I'm hoping maybe he will be here tomorrow. Um, on Friday, I'm doing two Facebook Lives. Um, I'm excited to introduce you all and my Ms. Medicine community to Dr. Lori Burkholz, who is our Ms. Medicine provider who's opening in Holland, Michigan very soon. Um, she's really um, exercise physiology trained and is an avid athlete and is really, really into nutrition and wellness. Um, and I think she'll have a lot of interesting um, thoughts about COVID um, and hope can take lots of questions. So we're going to do that joint Facebook Live at 11 o'clock on Friday. And then I'll do the regular Facebook Live after Governor DeWine's um, briefing, two o'clock briefing at three o'clock on Friday. Um, again, the office is open. Um, I was in the office all day yesterday and saw several patients and we're all doing lots of telemedicine visits. So again, please, please, please reach out to us if we can be helpful for you um, and stay home, stay safe, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.